The air we breathe, the water we drink, the environment we live in, they are all highly toxic. So what can you do to maintain your health in a toxic world? The answer is detoxification. There are a lot of different ways to detox. We're here to share the safest and most effective ways to rid your body of as many toxins as possible. I'm Dr. Steve Sinatra. And I'm Dr. Drew Sinatra. And this is Be Healthistic. Welcome to Be Healthistic, the podcast that is more than just health and wellness information. It's here to help you explore your options across traditional and natural medicine so that you can make informed decisions for you and your family. This podcast illuminates the whole story about holistic health by providing access to the expertise of Drs. Steve and Drew Sinatra, who together have decades of integrative health experience. Be Healthistic is powered by our friends at Healthy Directions. Now, let's join our hosts. Hi, folks. If you like what you hear today and you want to listen to future conversations on all things integrative and holistic health, Subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your favorite podcasts. Also, check out and subscribe to our YouTube channel, which will feature video versions of our episodes plus video extras you won't want to miss. And finally, we have more with me, Dr. Drew Sinatra, my dad, Dr. Steve Sinatra, and other Healthy Directions experts over on the Healthy Directions site. So visit HealthyDirections.com to explore our database of well-researched content and information. And of course, you can always follow us on our social media channels. Dad, the term detoxification, in my opinion, there's a, there's a misconception out there about what people think this really means. This is not alcohol and drug rehab and, and detoxification from those medications and those drugs. This is detoxification from chemicals in our environment. Absolutely. I mean, that's the elephant in the living room. We live in a toxic world. We do. I mean, we're going to go into the, the ubiquitous nature of all these chemicals that we're exposed to. But, you know, I'm curious, you know, you have detoxification in your six pillars of healing. Tell me about that. I mean, why, why is that the case? You know, as a young cardiologist, it was amazing. I used to see so many patients with coronary artery disease and myocardial infarction and congestive heart failure. And I was measuring heavy metals very early in my, you know, growth and development. And not only did I have a lot of heavy metals, and you and, and your brother did, but several of the dentists uh, in my practice were heavy metal toxic, you know, by the nature of their work. So at a very early age, I got accustomed to working with mercury intoxication. And then it wasn't just mercury, it was aluminum and lead, and just the heavy metals in general. And this is a big problem for health and aliveness today. Yeah, I mean, now that we're talking about heavy metals, I had a patient, this really opened my eyes. I had a patient a couple years ago, and we tested him for heavy metals, and he was really high in mercury and lead. Actually, the highest I've ever seen up to this point. And this was a young man. He was 61 years old with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Wow. Dreaded. He came in. He couldn't even walk. He couldn't talk. Uh, his wife had to tell the whole story for me. So we started up this sort of detox program, you know, getting rid of the heavy metals, chelating these heavy metals, the, the mercury and the lead from his body. And within six months, he was talking again. He was walking normally. He didn't have any balance issues. And a lot of his Parkinson's symptoms had decreased. And at that point, I was a major believer in detoxification because this guy, whatever he was doing, whether it was the water he was drinking, who knows where these sources of you know, mercury and lead were coming from, maybe the food he was eating. Getting them out of his body made a tremendous difference in his health. That's great doctoring, Drew. I'm really proud of you because, uh, you know, most clinicians don't think about detoxification. So the purpose for our listener today and our goal is to really enlighten and empower our listeners about how vital detoxification is. Let's talk about fish. What are some unhealthy fish that we should be avoiding or eating less often? And what are some he more healthier fish that we should be eating more often? Well, you know, back in the, I guess it was the 80s, there was this fear of meat. And as a substitute, we did a lot of swordfish. Oh, fish. I remember those big swordfish steaks on the grill. And unfortunately, swordfish, being a very larger fish, they tend to pick up mercury more so than the smaller fish. So, so the bigger the fish in the ocean, the, the, the worse fish. it is because they accumulate more mercury. Exactly. So big tuna would be 
another fish. In Florida, for example, where big grouper, you know, are, are caught. You know, when I go into a Florida restaurant and they recommend a grouper, grouper, my first question is, can you ask the chef how big that grouper was? Because there's small grouper out in Florida. The scamp, that, that's the name that they call them, scamp. They're delicious. They're only about they're 12 to 14 inches. They don't live in the ocean that long and they don't accumulate, you know, heavy metals. So that's, that's an important fact to realize. And, you know, another source of heavy metals, which is not really talked about that often in the conventional medical literature, is uh, amalgams, right? These, these amalgams that you yeah. get in your teeth, which have, they use mercury as a binding agent in there. And I'll tell you this, I've seen a lot of dentists in the last five years and none of them are doing mercury anymore. They're, none of them are doing the silver amalgams. They're kind of phasing that out very slowly, which is a very smart thing to do for the dental association. But at least that's a major source, to my knowledge, is is lessening these days. It's a paradigm shift. You're absolutely right. It takes a generation mm -hmm. of the younger dentists to really get this. And you know, I, I think this is vital. Yeah. And true, there's another metal out there, aluminum, mm -hmm. that's pervasive in the environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, one of the I guess one of the aspects of aluminum is your own deodorant. Yeah, those antiperspirants, right? Exactly. And uh, the first thing our listeners should do is look on a label and see if there's aluminum on that. I always thought there was an association of breast disease in women, and that can be for any, anything from fibrocystic to even, God forbid, cancer, where women are using aluminum deodorants because, again, it's a toxin that gets absorbed, puts stress on the lymphatic system, system the lymph nodes, et cetera. So this is something that all listeners need to really understand that there are simple situations in our environment that, that are toxic. Yeah, and you know, what I like to tell my patients is really when you're learning about these different toxins in the environment, the number one treatment is avoidance. And what that's what, exactly what we're talking about right now is really trying to avoid the exposures in the first place so we don't have that accumulation. And substitute other foods. Right. In other words, if you like fish, certainly Atlantic halibut is a good fish. Certainly smaller salmon, Pacific salmon. I mean, the smaller the sardines. fish, the better. Sard I think sardines are an incredible fish. Not only do sardines have abundant quantities of coenzyme Q10. I mean, you know, the nutrient that I feel enthralled about because I've been working with it for almost 40 years, but sardines contain a lot of calcium and they contain DMAE, you know, a substance that's calming for the autonomic nervous system. So, I mean, I'm, I'm all in on sardines. You know, anchovies, there was a contaminant in anchovies. I believe it was arsenic. But, uh, but in general, since anchovies are very small, if you like anchovies, I would say to use less anchovies because of this arsenic situation. And I don't know how pervasive it is right now. But it was brought to light a couple of years ago. Hopefully, they cleaned it up. But uh, again, the smaller the fish, the better. Well, we talked about heavy metals here, you know, several amalgams in your teeth and fish being primary sources. What other toxins in the environment should we be concerned about? I think the environment is pervasive and, you know, the air we breathe, I think is a good place to start. I heard on the news the other day that Los Angeles is cleaning up the toxic air environment. I mean, to me, that was music to my ears, you know, where uh, governmental agencies are finally getting that toxic air pollution uh, is significant. I remember writing in my newsletter years ago uh, at Healthy Directions about the collectors at toll booths, yeah, you know, from I've auto emissions, yes, you know. I always thought that, geez, I, I should hand these, attack, these toll collectors a little vitamin E because it was shown that, you know, vitamin E derivatives uh, would have an impact on the uh, treacherous aspects of air pollution. That these toxins that get into the lung uh, can be uh, a disaster, especially for young people. So we need to protect ourselves uh, from these, this onslaught of toxins in the environment. So anything you can do to lessen this burden on the body is important. So for example, an air purifier in oh, the home, love it, right? Love it's it. a great first step that people can take to just, hey, purify the indoor air, which by, by the way, they say is actually more toxic than the outdoor air. And that's because we have all this stuff in our home, these cleaning chemicals, we have carpets that have formaldehyde, couches that have flame retardant, oh, yeah. plastics, you name it. So you're actually breathing in all that stuff and having that air purifier is really gonna help clean up that air. And I'll tell you, Drew, if I go to a cleaner, uh, and it's 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 a non-organic cleaner, so they're using chemicals. Let those things air out, yeah. right? <laughs> I did that in the house. Remember? I mean, I would take a suit from a cleaner, you know, take off the uh, cellophane package or the plastic and everything, and hang it out in the garage for two or three days to air out, you know, or you know, or, or just hang it somewhere so the air was getting at it, so you know, it would t you know take out the chemicals. But even the dry cleaning, I mean, is people need to be privy to this. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, we do live in a toxic world. And simple things like cleaning ingredients at home, right? If you buy something that's more organic, doesn't have a lot of chemicals in it, that's a great place to start for just cleaning your home, whether it's your countertops, your toilets, your shower, right? You know, you've been doing the laundry. I mean, I'm exactly. in favor of these uh, uh, organic ingredients. Well, what do you like to recommend for air purifiers? Well, there's two aspects of an air purifier that are, are essential. One is UV light. You want to have the air purifier that has some UV light that uh, is going all the time, in addition to HEPA air filtration. In other words, H-E-P-A, where you're getting the molds out, you're getting pollen out, you're getting animal dander out, you're getting all these, you know, environmental toxins. And I'll tell you, Drew, in my house, in the bedroom, for example, that air purifier, I never turn off. It runs 24-7. And when the bulbs burn out, I just put in a, a fresh bulb, you know, for the UV light. That's the type of air purification uh, I like to use, especially in the bedroom. What about other sources? Any other sources of toxins that we should let our listeners know about? Anything else comes to mind here? Well, I, I worry about, you know, medications. You know, I remember seeing patients in the office, and uh, if they were on more than seven medications, I used to write the problem, you know, with a chart. You know how you do your charts? I used to write problem number eight or nine, pharmacologia. I mean, too many drugs. Polypharmacy. Yeah, polypharmacy, right. And, and basically, what I would talk to my patients is, you know, your liver has to detox a lot of these ingredients. It puts a stress on the liver. Uh, the kidney sometimes has to handle these ingredients uh, or the toxic metabolites of these ingredients. So, so basically, it just makes sense to take as least amount of pharmaceutical drugs as possible. And one of the goals of my practice as a, you know, sort of a conventional cardiologist in recovery was I would wean down the amount of pharmaceutical drugs. But I would never, never put a patient in danger or in jeopardy because some patients absolutely do need pharmaceutical support. There's no question about that. Yeah, absolutely. Now, we talked about air being a primary source here for, for exposure. Uh, we've talked about foods before in previous podcasts, right? Making sure you're eating organic foods and minimize your exposure to pesticides. Let's talk about water, okay? Because water is so essential, right? We all need water. We need to live our lives, we drink water every single day. But we need to make sure that our water is clean. What do you like to recommend for water? Well, in my own home, for example, uh, I have water filters all over the place. But I have the uh, big filters in my basement that take out chlorine and, and other ingredients. I mean, I was at a hotel here and took a shower, and the chlorine smell was just incredibly uh, pervasive. I mean, I was almost like <coughs> coughing in the shower. Look, I get it. We, got, we have to use chlorine to... Uh, you know, kill a lot of, uh, you know, the germs in the environment. Uh, but you know what? Chlorine and bromide and, and iodine, you know, these halogens, they replace uh, iodine, you know, in the thyroid gland, these halogens. Mm -hmm. Bromide, for example, that's found in a lot of bagels, can, can actually uh, render, you know, somebody who's susceptible to thyroid disease. Because again, when you replace iodine in the thyroid gland, the thyroid gland needs uh, iodine, you know, for thyrox thyroxine uh, and, and uh, T4, T3 production. So basically, people need to realize that, you know, these chemicals in the environment are very serious. And by the way, thyroid disease, hypothyroidism, uh, I believe is epidemic in our society, not only because of some of the foods we eat, but the electromagnetics as well. I mean, you know, cell phone use, cordless phone use. Uh, you know, whenever you put a cell phone towards your ear, these electromagnetics uh, can have a serious effect on mm -hmm. the thyroid gland. And, you know, since our conversation is about a toxic environment, remember EMF is, is, is a toxin, you know, and it's just as bad a toxin as a toxin we ingest in our food. Yeah, yeah. Well, back to water really quick. I wanted to talk uh, briefly about uh, plastic versus glass. Now, I know you, oh. me, whenever we travel, we, we tend to buy the, the glass water bottles. This is not only for our bodies, because we don't want the phthalates in our bodies, but this is also for the environment as well. I mean, right now, this is, I think I read this a couple years ago, there is a, a plastic heap in the ocean that's just floating there in the Pacific Ocean that's two times the size of Texas. So we have so much plastic in our water right now. And I heard an estimate the other day that it's around 10 years from now, there's going to be more plastic by weight than fish in our oceans. And that just saddens me deeply because we are inundated with plastic all around us. And guess what? We're, plastic's entering our bodies as well, and it's killing the environment. Hey, it's killing us, our bodies as well. I mean, phthalates are, uh, you know, it's a toxin. So what's a takeaway we can give our listeners right now? 
If you had a choice between water in a glass bottle or a plastic bottle, what should you choose? Oh, glass. Glass immediately. No, no questions asked. And let's say also, um, let's talk about plastic bags really quick while we're on the subject. If you're going to a grocery store, you're walking into Whole Foods, whatever it is, make sure you've got your reusable bags with you. And if you forgot, go back to your car. All right. We've been talking about all the sources of toxicity in the environment. Let's now shift gears to this beautiful body that we have and the amazing detoxification mechanisms that it inherently has. We have our organs of elimination, right? Our skin, our kidneys, our liver, our lungs, our GI tract. And these are amazing systems that help eliminate toxins from the body. So dad, what's your favorite method of detoxification? I have to say the foreign fritz sauna, uh, I just feel is, is so good. Look, Drew, here's the, here's the bottom line. These toxins that we're talking about, they lie in our subcutaneous fat. Uh, so basically, if you sweat, let's say in a sauna, uh, and the vibratory nature of the chemicals or the heavy metals or whatever it is that are laying in below the skin in that subcutaneous layer, when the heat comes up and you're sweating, these chemicals now, especially even heavy metals and insecticides, pesticides, you know, whatever it is, they're coming out through the skin. I know that sweating is one of the best ways of detoxification. Well, look, you don't need to have the, uh, I mean, I, look, I think I agree with you. The infrared sauna is a terrific way to detox, but you, all you really need is a way to sweat. Exactly. That's the fundamental. You just need to be able to sweat. And we learned from Dr. Crinian at one of the environmental medicine conferences we went to that really all you need is a hot box. It doesn't have to be this fancy infrared sauna. He talked about his patients going into the, the bathroom, turning up the fan and the heat and sweating that way. I mean, all you really need is a method of sweating to get out these toxins. And that's the beauty oh, of it. That's great. And you know, I gotta tell you in Florida, uh, there was some uh, hot yoga they were advertising and uh, somebody in my building asked me if I wanted to go. I said, sure. I'll tell you, Drew, the first time I did a hot yoga section, uh, session, it was amazing. First of all, I was the oldest guy in the room, okay? I'll put that out. And about halfway through, half the room cleared out because it was probably about 110 degrees in there. And what kept me going was I was there because I didn't want to quit. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm the last person to quit any athletic endeavor. And I want to tell you, these postures and these exercises in 110 degrees, I did everything I could to stay there. But I was saying to myself, look, you're detoxing, you're detoxing, you're sweating. I mean, there's a big payoff here for you. Stick it out, stick it out. And I was so glad. And, I, and when I went outside and it was 90 degrees, it was like going into a refrigerator from being <laughs> into a, like 110 degrees. It was awesome. But sweating is phenomenal. And I just hope our listeners understand this because it is, it is really a medicinal way of cleansing your body. Yeah, and one quick tip here for our listeners is uh, if you're going to do hot yoga, maybe you start off with a gentle hot yoga, right? There's there's Bikram out there, which I'm sure you've done as oh, well. Yeah, yeah. And Bikram's great, but it's really intense. And I don't suggest that people start off with Bikram. It's really hot in there, and the postures are really challenging. Um, and, you know, some yoga studios just kind of add a gentle heat to the room. And so you just kind of break a light sweat, which is still great. The sweat I was in was incredible. And thank God I had my electrolyte drink with me. Because all I was thinking about was I don't want to get a cramp here. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, that 500 milligrams of uh, potassium, I was, it, was it, it gave me a lot of comfort in my mind knowing that not only was I rehydrating, and by the way, the instructor was saying, drink, drink, drink. He kept on saying rehydrate. Not only was he rehydrating with water, but with, with electrolytes as well. It was and I'm, I'm happy you brought that up because hydration, electrolytes, make sure you drink enough water is really a foundation of detoxification. You got to be able to flush the toxins out of your system through your kidneys. So right. drink, drink, drink with electrolytes. You know, I see a lot of people drinking water all day long, all day long, all day long. Well, guess what? Intracellularly, they're still dehydrated. Correct. I mean, the key to hydration is that we must get the water inside our cells so we can get the hydration in and funnel the toxins out of the cell. What's happened today because of this toxic environment is uh, we're drinking all this water, it's going in and it's going out, but it's not detoxifying our cells. Mm -hmm. So what we need are high vibrational waters. And this, there's some of them out there, out there like the hydrogen waters, for example. Mm -hmm. There's deuterium depleted water. These new waters that I'm seeing at these cutting edge, leading edge conferences, uh, we must bring to our viewers because I think water is gonna be so medicinal in the future because we need a highly 
um, medicinal water to get into our cells and rehydrate our cells on the intracellular level because we're all dehydrated. You know, I also have a lot of patients that come in and they tell me, Doc, I'm drinking water like it's going out of style, right? They've got those huge liters of water and they drink, you know, two, three of them a day. And then when I run some blood work on them, I tend to look at the, um, the BUN, which is the blood urea nitrogen. And if that's elevated, I have a little higher suspicion that they might be dehydrated. Of course, there's other reasons for the BUN to be high. I also look at the urinalysis that I run on most patients. And if the specific gravity is high or on the high end of normal, another reason to suspect that they may not be holding on to their water as much, even though they are drinking a lot, so they're not technically hydrated. And then thirdly, I like to run the skin turgor test on them, which is really picking up the skin on top of the hand and letting it go. And if it returns very quickly back to the hand, that's a sign that they are hydrated. If it takes more than two, three seconds for the skin to come back, then typically it's a sign of dehydration. Even though you drink a lot of water, you still could be dehydrated. Exactly. Uh, this is a problem again. And intracellular hydration, I think, is going to be one of one of the most important aspects of, of detoxification detoxifying the body on the cellular level. Now, earlier you brought up that um, detoxification is, is kind of a, a daily thing. When I think of detoxification, it's, it's all about the avoidance, number one, and then number two is really getting these toxins out of your body. And I, I like to do and think of this as a daily practice. So we'll kind of get into these things that you can do on a daily practice, like a sauna, for example, or making sure that you're hydrated, right, to support detoxification. But I really want our, our viewers and our listeners to understand that Yes, you can do a detox for a week or two weeks or do a cleanse, uh, but really think of detoxification as a daily practice. Right, and I'll tell you what I do in the evening before I go to bed, maybe about an hour before, I take a, a psyllium powder and I take a, a couple of tablespoons of that. I use my electrolyte drink because I like the flavor of the pomegranate and I like the minerals because I need the, you know, everybody needs minerals. I use a prebiotic, probiotic type of powder and basically, I'll stir it up, shake it up, and I'll drink it quickly. And I'm getting all this fiber in my body. Again, you know, the average American only t takes in less than 20 grams of fiber. We need like 40 grams of fiber. Mm -hmm. So once I take this into my body, the bowel cleansing the next morning is much improved, right? When I have patients come into my office and say, Doc, I just, I'm constipated. I can't go. I used to tell them to walk more. Walking is a great remedy for uh, constipation drinking more fluids, but then, you know, that was the old days when I was a doctor. Now that I'm, you know, more enlightened, I realize that, you know, whatever you put in, you may not be rehydrating the body because you still have intracellular dehydration. And now I, I use this drink, you know, this psyllium drink, because this gets more fiber, you're drinking more fluid, you, with, with the fiber, you're expanding the GI tract and you're in, improving uh, transit time, and basically GI cleansing is the way to go. You know what would be a great addition to that is adding on some bitters. Bitters have, you know, cholagog and choleretic properties, which means they really get bile flow. You mean drops of bitters? Yeah, just you don't need that much, right? You can take bitters before meals, but really it'll help sort of dump more toxins from the gallbladder into the liver and therefore into the GI tract. True. That's a pearl. Now, another simple detox thing that people can do at home is a skin brushing. So oh, yeah. simple. You buy a little loofah sponge from the store. And what you do is you, you uh, it's, it's kind of a, it's not a soft sponge, it's a little bit firmer. And what you want to do is you want to start at your feet with these little gentle strokes and move upward, right? Both legs and then start at your arms, go to your abdomen, your back. And you want to direct all of that to your heart, right? That's where the lymph sort of right. drains there, right? And um, that's a great way to get your lymphatic system working more efficiently because you're exfoliating the skin. The lymphatics are really right below the, the skin there. Oh, and lymphatic massage is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, even some of these practitioners that do lymphatic massage, that's a great way of activating these lymphatic ducts, which also support overall detoxification in the body. Right. And then, you know, the liver being this major organ, probably one of the most important organs for elimination. It's involved in, you know, phase one, phase two, detoxification. You know, a simple naturopathic principle or technique that I've recommended to patients over the years is the castor oil pack. Right, because castor oil, if you apply it topically, it actually has like anti-inflammatory properties to it and it can support the function of the liver. So what patients can do is rub a little castor oil on their belly and over their liver. If they want, they can add a little heating pad to that to help drive it in and let that sit for 30 minutes to an hour and then you're done. I'm glad you brought up the liver. There's an entity that is so pervasive in our society today. It's called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. 
And the reason why I stumbled up on this is uh, I do a lot of you know Q10, CoQ10 investigations. And basically I was screening the internet and it was saying that coenzyme Q10 was one of the better remedies for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. You know, the more I delved into it, the more I realized how pervasive this is in our toxic environment because the liver is getting overwhelmed. Well, you can't win this battle just doing all the things we talked about with just saunas and, you know, perhaps just doing some psyllium husk and maybe some people will do colonics or enemas, right? And all this cleansing that you can do, you need, you need to have something on board daily, something like NAC that I think is just so powerful to help clean out the liver, support detoxification pathways in the body and get this stuff out. In other words, we got to give the body some natural raw materials it needs to help combat this toxic environment we live in. It just makes sense. It makes total sense. I mean, the body is inherently intelligent. It knows what to do, okay? That's the beautiful thing. Even though the body was never exposed to these toxins, and by the way, we have 80,000 chemicals in our environment right now, at least, if not more. And unfortunately, there's never really been testing on these chemicals. so. They are likely not safe for us, but the body knows how to get rid of these chemicals. It just blows my mind. There was a study I, I wanted to mention, and uh, this involves the gut. So researchers gave uh, these mice a particular strain of probiotic called Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG. They gave these mice the probiotic for two weeks, and then they administered acetaminophen, which is Tylenol. They gave the acetaminophen in a pretty high dose to induce liver toxicity. And what they found was that the mice taking the lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, they had less liver toxicity or less liver damage. So that blew my mind because I had no idea that a probiotic could actually help support liver function, but it does. I think someday, again, because of this toxic environment, we're gonna have to use probiotics in a way that we consume them on a daily basis. And we may have to increase the number of strains in the probiotics. Uh, you know, there's strains for the large bowel, there's strains for the, uh, the small bowel. You know, there's one thing that we didn't mention, which I think is, is worthy of mention here, is fasting, right? Because fasting oh. is a great way to give the GI tract a rest. Uh, you're going to improve metabolism. It's going to be supportive for the heart, supportive for the brain. And it's something that people can do every single day. They can just do an intermittent fast, even if it's just 16 hours. Oh, I love that. I mean, you're singing to the choir when you say that. So, Drew, as a naturopath, you do a lot of detox in your practice. I mean, I'm sure these patients experience things in their body, mind, and spirit. I mean, I mean, what's been your experience? I mean, what's the feedback these patients give you? Well, generally, if, if patients are doing a daily detox, which is something that I recommend, there really is no adverse side effect that people are going to feel. I mean, it's kind of rare. You might see it occasionally to see a headache or maybe some fatigue that might present or um, some emotional changes, right, some irritability that might come up. With the daily detox, which is something that I, I highly recommend, we don't really see side effects. Now, if people haven't done much with detoxification and they jump into all these therapies that we talked about, they may feel worse before they feel better. And they may have brain fog. They may feel really tired. They may have joint pain. They may have diarrhea. I mean, there's all sorts of symptoms that can arise. And I really, I, I want to caution people listening to this to be careful because there's a lot of detoxes that you can do from online, like these, you know, these two week cleanses and three week cleanses. And, you know, some of them may not be healthy. So that's why we like to stick to the more of the safer proven therapies. You know, I'm glad you mentioned that because whenever you detox and the body discharges toxins into the bloodstream, where they, they come out of the cells, like I talked about before, the person may feel worse. Remember, folks, you may feel a little bit worse before you get better. Exactly. Yeah, the storm will pass, right? Exactly. Now, in my personal experience, I just completed a 108-hour uh, fast. It was a, a vision quest or a vision fast, if you want to call it that, and I did it in the, uh, the, the mountains of uh, California near Yosemite, and it was profound. It was profound on many different levels. I, I did drink water during it. Uh, it was supervised, and I do recommend to our viewers listening that uh, if you're going to do longer than a, a two-day fast, you should probably talk to your doctor about supervision and different provisions that you can do, whether that's resting and make sure you're drinking a lot of water, et cetera. But uh, anyone wanting to do an extended fast, I would certainly talk to their doctor. But I want to let our listeners know that when you complete a fast, it's not starvation. You know, a lot of, I think a lot of people in your generation actually tend to think that fasting is like starvation, but that's a misconception. I mean, well, you know this. I mean, I'm talking to you, you know this, but a lot of people, your friends perhaps would say, well, why are you doing this? Why are you starving yourself? But hey, religions around the world, there's been leaders that have done this 
for thousands and thousands of years. Fasting is so healthy and cleansing for the body. And when I did my fast, I can tell you this, yet the first day I was very tired, right? I knew that I was probably mobilizing some toxins. But by the second and third day, my brain was on fire. I was so clear in my thoughts, so crystal clear. And I felt very present in the moment. And I even had a moment of that sort of oneness that people experience with nature. And I think that can only happen really when you are fasting and spending a lot of time in nature. So I encourage people to do at least an intermittent fast, give it a shot, see how they feel. And if they want to extend it out to a two-day fast, great, maybe a three-day, maybe a four-day fast at some point. Good point. Now, as a wrap up, what can our viewers do, our listeners do, as a simple detoxification for, let's say, a week? What can they do? Yeah, that's a good point, Drew. I mean, one week, folks, go on an organic diet. I mean, eat a clean diet. Try to get some sweating into your daily routine every day. Now, you could get a, you could go into a sauna, you could exercise, you could put extra shirts on. I mean, but just try to sweat a little bit for at least a half hour, you know, uh, per day for that week. Uh, take in some psyllium fiber at night. Uh, I would also take in a thousand milligrams of N-acetylcysteine to, to give you uh, some nutraceutical support and try a gluten-free diet for that one week. After that, I suspect that uh, you're going to have some changes that will be visible and noticeable in your body. An easy one-week introductory Drew Sinatra, Dr. Sinatra's program. Simple and practical. Hey everyone. So before we wrap up today's episode, I wanted to share our wellness wisdom for the day. We've been talking about detoxification and different ways you can safely remove various toxins from your body. In terms of food, we talked about fish and how eating smaller types of fish can lower exposure to mercury and other heavy metals. But what about foods that we can eat that will help promote the detoxification process? The Food Revolution Network has suggested a bunch of detoxifying foods to help your body heal naturally. So I wanted to share some of those with you. Cruciferous vegetables and leafy greens, which are high in antioxidants that help support detoxification pathways. Beets, which can enhance the body's production of glutathione, a key compound for detoxification. And garlic, as garlic is a really potent antimicrobial, but also it helps support glutathione levels. Eating some of these pro-detoxifying foods could really help in flushing out your system naturally. Remember everyone, if you liked what you heard today and you want to be an active member of the Be Healthistic community, subscribe to our podcasts on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your favorites. And subscribe to the Healthy Directions YouTube channel. You can also find more great content and information from us and the Healthy Directions team at HealthyDirections.com. I'm Dr. Drew Sinatra. And I'm Dr. Steve Sinatra. This is Be Healthistic. See you next time. Thanks for listening to Be Healthistic, powered by our friends at Healthy Directions with Drs. Drew and Steve Sinatra. See you next time.